right, so this is Arco Student Reporter with uh, Mr. Appleby, who represents, please, go ahead, introduce yourself. Michael Appleby, I'm with the World Society for Protection of Animals. World Society for Protection of Animals. We have our head office in London, UK, and offices around the world, including here in Beijing. Okay, and are you part of the United Kingdom office in London? That's right. Okay, so <coughs> you came here to talk about food security. Yes, I... I the title World Resources Forum uh, is, a, is a big one. It seems mm -hmm. to me that one of the most important resources we need to consider as the world population grows and its resources have become more limited is food security. Okay. How did you feel about the dinner served? Uh, the, and the lunches? That's a, that's a good question. Um, one of the impressions I had is that Nobody had actually given thought to the resource implications about those, uh, those meals. Um, nearly every goat conference I go to in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, there are vegetarian options, and there oh, were vegetarian options here, okay. but the, the large majority of the dishes were meat-based, and the balance between animal-based foods and plant-based foods yes. is one of the most important issues today in food security. Very much so, very much so. So I've got two questions regarding that. Firstly, the European uh, Asia thing. Do you think that's a cultural issue or is it just a lack of awareness when it comes to animal products and their role in the food industry and their role in the environment? Uh, I think it's both. Uh, clearly, uh, the history and development of diet uh, in Europe and in Asia have, have come by different routes. Uh, and an awful lot of that is uh, contingent on how much money people have. And one of the historical effects in Europe, which we had gone through, was increasing financial security. Uh, and the degree to which when people become financially secure, they tend to eat more animal products, mm -hmm. particularly meat. Yes. Uh, and that process is still happening in Asian countries like, okay. like China. Okay, given the fact that they're still acquiring income. All right. Now, the follow-up question I mentioned. Uh, of late, there has been the talk of veganism with regards to food. Now, how do you coincide the two, environmentalism and veganism? I mean, you have James Cameron on the news. Given that no one takes James Cameron seriously, I should state that for the camera. But, you know, he's all going on about, you know, environmentalism. And among other people, what, what would you be your response to that? Uh, my response is that we need, as, as a world population, or indeed as populations within individual countries, um, we need to eat less animal products or uh, to slow down the increase in animal products and I, we have to recognize there's a big variation between individuals. Right, in a so. country like China, uh, the growth in animal product consumption, meat consumption, is largely among people of middle and upper incomes, it's mm -hmm. not among the poor and mal malnourished. Mm -hmm. And clearly there are many poor and malnourished people in the world mm -hmm. who would still benefit from eating a little bit more Very animal much products. Very much so. but Taking it as a very unreasonable shortcut to think about the average, um, it's clear that the, the total consumption and therefore the an average consumption needs to be slowed down or, or reduced. Okay. Now, some of that effect may be created by people becoming vegetarian or vegan. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, there are very few people that are willing to make that choice. Of course. And overall, the impact of everybody eating a bit less meat would be greater than a very small number of people becoming vegetarian or vegan. True. True. My own particular concern is uh, with the treatment of animals and the welfare of those animals, mm -hmm. and that's clearly. I was hoping you would come to that. That's yeah. clearly affected by the method of uh, the system of production, how intensive it is, what the housing system is, how the animals are fed, and so on. Uh, and. Uh, it's important to me and to many people that animals are treated well. Yes. Uh, and that is fulfilled by an increasing number of farms. Yep. Some countries are having, having legislation controlling what can be done in farming. Mm -hmm. uh, in others, it's a question of, of choice, whether people are choosing organic food, for example. And in general, animals farmed organically have better welfare than those that are farmed in intensive systems. True, true. And that change will come more from people choosing less meat, but also which meat mm -hmm. they can buy, 
yeah. rather than they then necessarily choosing to eat no meat. True. So it's all about the enlightened consumer in this aspect. A, a, a lot of it must come down to consumer choice. Uh, there's also clearly room for public policy. Of course. Uh, there has traditionally been uh, support in many countries from governments for industries to become more efficient and that has usually been interpreted as becoming more intensive yeah. uh, and countries like China for example their, in, their agricultural industries are generally becoming more intensive. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of food security that's a serious problem okay. because many of the animals under those systems are being fed grain which could be fed directly to people in a much more efficient way. True. So that brings us right back to the beginning when I talked about the balance between animal and plant food yes. consumption. That's the important parameter at the end of the day. Brilliant. And uh, I'd like to, since we're on the topic of animal welfare, and given that we are in a country like China, which hasn't traditionally been known to, for lack of a better word, care for animal welfare, I mean, do you, uh, perhaps this is not the forum for that, but do you actually see that happening in China, the, the pushing forward for it's, animal rights? It's beginning to grow. Part of the issue is visibility. Yes. Uh, in, in some ways, I, I lived for some years in the United States, and in some ways there are parallels between China and the United States. How, because how? the size of the country and the number of the people mean that people are not familiar with how their food is produced. Mm -hmm. Somebody in New York buying milk, it may come from cows in California. Yes. They don't know how those cows are kept. And very much the same is true in China. People don't see their food production. But in terms of what they do see, there's an increasing concern, for example, for the welfare of street dogs. Okay. And how, those, how stray dogs are treated and, and, and how they're looked after. Uh, it is also true that everybody has different concerns and overlapping concerns. And we find, uh, we've done public polls, and there is a growing concern for animal welfare in China, particularly overlapping with concerns for food safety. Okay. And that, again, where does my food come from? Is it safe? Has been affected by the very public food safety scandals in China, such as the milk scandal, yep. and people are now, the, the, the production of organic food in China is still quite small, but it's growing rapidly. People want to know their food is safe, and when you inform them about how it's produced, they care about it. You know, interesting you bring up the milk scandal, because uh, when it was happening, I was studying in Holland, and I had a bunch of Chinese students with me, and what they were doing to make money on the side was importing tons of milk powder from Holland, and to their families here who would then sell it, mainly because it had the Dutch label on it. Though it was the exact same company producing two different brands, of, uh, two different labels in China and Holland. I mean, it's, sometimes it's really about perception, isn't it, more often? It is perception, and it is true that we've got to solve these problems internationally. Yes. Um, I actually think that increased trade and increased transport of food around the world often makes things worse. Uh, Europe, for example, is the European um, livestock producers are generally seeing growing meat consumption around the world as an opportunity. They say, we can grow meat efficiently, let's grow it and send it to African countries and Asian countries and around the world. That tends to undercut the local producer exactly. in African countries and in Asian countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the long term, when you've got to consider the transport costs and the reliability of transport, it may undercut food security. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to see more countries moving towards uh, their own food self-sufficiency. Of course, not every country can be 100% self, self-sufficient, but we can move more in that direction. Uh, and part of that, again, will be individual choices, but also public policies on dietary choices. Brilliant, brilliant. Anyway, on that note, I think we shall end the interview as you do have a plenary session to get to. Thank you, Mr. Appleby. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. This was Akash with Oiko Student Reporter, and uh, yeah, have a brilliant day. Thank you.